Leeds, 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 what is happening? It is I, Latrine. Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Working Hours podcast. This interview was recorded in December last year, just after the election. I had to make a few cuts to this to take out a lot of me wittering, but to try and also keep as much of the discussion intact as I could. I'm still learning here, both with the interviewing and with the production of these episodes. So, without further wittering from me, here's episode 4 with Brendan Campbell. So, um, your job hunting current... Well, you are working. I am working, just not enough. Yeah. So you're underemployed. Mm -hmm. You are one of the underemployed. That's how you would be termed. So you're looking for more hours. I'm hoping to become one of the precariat, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> you, you're <laughs> kind of precariat there. anyway, because yeah. you're underemployed. So it feels fucking precarious. Yeah, it? that's pretty precarious. Um, at least you haven't got a mortgage. Yeah, mm. yeah thank God for that. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, what are you doing at the moment then in your underemployed capacity? Uh, I'm working in a local bar part-time, mostly weekends. Okay. Um, I am available for other shifts through the week, <laughs> but they're prioritised for full-time staff, uh, which is understandable. Um, are you on the zero <clears> hour, <throat> zero hours contract? Or? Yeah, yeah, essentially. But I'm getting a couple of shifts a week regularly. <laughs> um, my other job, ESL teaching, that has dried up a lot although i did get a message yesterday as uh, asking if i could cover a shift in the afternoon mm -hmm. um unfortunately they contacted me on whatsapp which i don't get notifications for and i don't always remember to check so yeah. by the time i looked at it you know that ship had sailed yeah uh, which is a shame but it's good to know that they're still contacting me about covering classes and stuff like that yeah um but did you chase them up anyway and just say, you know, drop me an email or a text or whatever? Well, um, um, the school is actually on the same street as the job centre and I've got an appointment there on Friday. So okay. I'm away to the job centre for my universal credit meeting. I'm going to stop in there and be kind of like, still available. Yeah. Um, if you could figure out how to give me some semi-regular, um, you know, shifts working, that would be great. Mm. Um, but as it is, it's just kind of as and when they need me kind of covering some on call, which is great if it comes through a lot, but it's just not reliable. Mm. Um, and it's tough thinking that I want to be looking for another job, but I would struggle to find a job that pays me as well as that teaching job does, mm -hmm. but I'm just not getting enough hours. But if I hang in there, I think somebody might be leaving soon. So maybe something else might open up there. Okay. We'll see. I mean, at least you've got that skill to fall back on. So um, ESL, English as a second language. Um, so what, what did you do? That, so you wouldn't have done a Tefal, you did... Did the CELTA, which is, I describe it as like Tefal on steroids, right. an intensive month-long course. Yep. Um, and it's Cambridge affiliated, so it's got a bit more clout than your average common garden variety Tefal. I think there are a lot of like... Tefl Cowboys playing fast and loose where it's easy to get any kind of Tefl qualification and then start teaching. But this one I decided to get because I don't have a degree. Mm -hmm. Whereas like if you've got Tefl and a um, bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. you can kind of teach English anywhere in the world. Yeah. But what I discovered at the end of the Tefl course, unfortunately, when they had people from various language schools come in and talk about employment opportunities, yeah. was that for instance, China is obviously a huge market for it right now. And uh, there's one uh, company of language schools with the rather unfortunate name English First. Right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they, you know, you could sign up with them. They'd fly you out and get you in a school straight away mm -hmm. upon completing your, your CELTA mm -hmm. if you've got a degree. Yeah. So uh, that was a bit of a knockback. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the degree thing is a really weird thing these days. I mean, I can kind of understand, to a degree. Um, I remember when I when I got back from Amsterdam, so this would have been 2003, and looking for work in Leeds, and the amount of jobs that were, you know, you need a degree to apply sort of thing. Um, it, it really stood out to me, the amount of jobs that were sort of like barriered away from me because I didn't have a degree and then post doing my degree which I did later in life like it doesn't sort of help it doesn't it's not like you've got 
past that barrier. It's it's sort of yeah, it's a it's a weird one. It's like I, the the degree was well worth doing for its own merits, mm. but in terms of like advancing my employment prospects, yeah, I don't I don't think. You mean in terms of the yeah, it hasn't really opened opened any doors or anything. It's not really like you know. It, but there isn't a single job that I think my degree has contributed towards. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily know because who knows what. That's not the degree itself. What about the experience gained through doing the Absolutely. course? That's something you can point to. Yeah, I mean, that... and say, look, I know how to do all this shit now. Yeah. And that's got, got to count for something, right? You would hope so. I think, it, it, well, it's like with anything, it's, it, it's the ability to sell it, isn't it, really? It doesn't matter what skills you have in reality or how competent you are in reality i mean we just have to look at our leadership <laughs> mm. it's it, it's what you can sell to people it's what you can fake out to people i think of like yeah i could do that and it's like you you can't but if you can blag it then you you, you won there's someone who can mm. actually do it might sit down and go oh and really think about it <laughs> yeah uh, it's unfortunate that if like you and i you have a sensitivity and a resistance to bullshit. Mm. Having to participate in a system that runs on bullshit is <laughs> fucking galling, man. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It's very galling. Um, so, what, are you, what sort of roles are you looking for then at the moment? I mean, that's kind of limited you. Are you just sort of looking to pick up additional hours wherever you can? Or are you wanting something that's a more nine to five full time? <clears throat> doing something what would be your ideal what would be the ideal yeah i struggle with that i can't i haven't really settled on what the ideal job might be yet so i mean, I mean you've got like when, when was your first job when, when was the first paid employment you got um probably when i was about 19 20 something like that right well i mean maybe before that i had bits and pieces Working, I don't know, working various places like when I was say, 17, after finishing school, when mm-hmm. I went to Canada, um, managed to score a pretty good job when I arrived in Toronto working for an art centre there. Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> you're dual, you're, you've got dual citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was able to work in Canada as well. So uh, Harbourfront Centre in Toronto, uh, down on the waterfront, obviously, Harbourfront Centre. Uh, and they, I was, it was a telemarketing gig, but it was like the best possible one for me anyway, because I was selling like tickets to ballet seasons and like different festivals and things like this that were all running. Like, mm-hmm. So it was arts based. Um, and because I had a British accent um, and there are a bunch of Anglophiles over there, I was fucking killing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it also, it was just signing people up for things that they already wanted anyway. It's kind of like, we we'll notice that you've been to this the last few years in a row. It's a really exciting season again this year. Do you want, okay, great. We'll sign you up. <laughs> and um, a few months on the bounce, I'd like kind of get a bonus for like the most char- like, <clears throat> charitable contributions as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, did pretty well with that. And then kind of struggled to find anything when I went out west. But then came back here and just started working like restaurant bar gigs and stuff like that. And kind of... It's easy to fall into a bit of a bit of a rut with that, unless you decide to make that more of a career and like. It's kind of like being typecast of, of like you, your job history sort of dictates what what you've done before dictates what you do next. Yeah, and also it can really suck you in as well, um, just in terms of the lifestyle. You get used to working kind of irregular hours. Yeah, like shift work. Yeah, um, having bits of the day to yourself. Yeah, and appreciate it having days off in the middle of the week. Yeah, sort of like you kiss your weekends goodbye, but that's all right um, because you're working with a bunch of people who are in the same kind of boat. So you just, you know, find your free time elsewhere. Yeah, um, and you know, it's it's fun. It already can be fun. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a job like any job, so it's also a ball ache. But yeah, I mean, you you've still got to get up and make yourself go in, and you know. It's like, yeah, there, there, there's lots of upsides to it because it's nice to have a job where you are literally just coming in, doing the job and going home. Like the downsides are like, okay, well, you, they, they squeeze extra work out of you for free or whatever. Like, you know, the place closes and you've stopped getting paid, but you still have to wait until you've closed everything up and things like that. But on the other hand, 
you don't have loads of responsibility. You're not like, you, you don't have to make sure that that whatever has got to such and such a place at whatever time, because it's just like pour drinks when people ask me to pour drinks. So you're not mm-hmm. carrying a lot of responsibility. You, you know, it's, it's a straightforward job where you come in and you do and you go. Yeah. I mean, this responsibility is very contained, very focused and low stakes. It's kind of like in terms of like, like that example, like delivery, it's kind of like, we've got to make sure this food that's been ordered by this table gets to that table yeah. in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, someone's night will be ruined. <laughs> I'm kind of like, and people will freak out in the moment. Oh, yeah. kind of like, Jesus Christ, table 15 haven't got their starters yet. What the fuck is going on here? It's kind of like, listen, guys, feel like no one's going to die. We're not surgeons, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can, un- you, you can understand... It, it's the swan thing, isn't it? Of like you, you're trying to present the beautiful gliding swan on the mm-hmm. water, and then underneath is just like, oh my god, god everything's everything. falling apart. <laughs> All very showbiz mentality. <laughs> like, as soon as you go through that door, marks private. It's just absolute chaos. <clears throat> it's exhilarating. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you have recently been thinking of doing the degree then. Yeah. Okay, so you you're looking at that. Any trepidation about that? Is it any nerves about potentially going back into education? Um, yeah, but that is kind of overridden by more kind of excitement. Yeah, uh, and the idea of doing something I'm interested in, and it just it feels like the right thing for me to do. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a school of thought that, you know, in a, in a recession or whatever, a downturn is like the best thing to invest in is yourself and draining. Mm. Um, you know, there's no point throwing more money out. And because the job in itself can be, you know, it's an expenditure, as, it, as is having a job. You know, I always find that I spend a lot more money when I am working than when I'm not working. Because you're in work, you know, you like you get your breakfast on the go or whatever, and then you've got to buy your lunch, and then you pay for bus tickets, and then... You finish being at work and you're in town and it's like oh it's been it's a nice day or it's been a bad day i might go for a pint and you mm-hmm. it's so much easier to spend mm-hmm. oh, sorry about that <laughs> um but yeah when when i'm not working you, you you're sort of in the mindset of not spending so it's a lot easier mm, to spend. that's true um so what would you say is the best or most fun job you've done um I kind of took it for granted, but when I was working for my family business for North East Life magazines, mm. like I got to go to various different cultural events like theatre, film, music things, yep. writing reviews. Um, I enjoy editing. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy taking other people's shoddy writing and whipping it into shape so it's fucking readable. Yeah. Um, and working with words. Um, I mean, I, I don't enjoy writing i find it laborious and taxing um i enjoy having written which is i think the case with most people who write professionally i think the thing is with writing like from my experience of the little bits of writing that i've done is um you know you've got that tyranny of the blank page where you're staring at it and it's like uh. but once you get those first few words down and the actual thoughts start flowing and like that's where it's sort of easy hmm. the the outpouring of words and then it gets a bit more complicated when you actually like for me when you have to structure it into a, a cohesive piece of prose or whatever copy um that that's the work bit like figuring out which bit needs to go where where for me i don't know if it's the same for you yeah <clears throat> well, the thing is, because like I say, I'm, I'm good at editing other people's stuff, but maybe not my own. It's kind of like I generally just sort of like spaff it out and kind of like generally the, the first draft is the one I go with. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time like pouring back over it because I'm just kind of I'm just happy to get it out of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like some sort of like unpleasant boil that's been lanced or something <laughs> like that. Um, but like before I get down to it, it's like the idea of having to do it. Mm. Uh and I mean, like, at the time, 
you know, people say, oh, you, you write well, you're a good writer and everything. And I'm kind of like, oh, I guess I'm maybe I'm all right. I don't know, probably a bit shit. I don't think I'm that great. I read a lot of great writers and know what that looks like. My stuff doesn't look like that. So uh, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, but you're not, they're not writing film reviews for a, a, a local magazine. You know, you know, yeah. Maybe if you were writing a novel, your writing would look like that. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> well, I'm better get cracking that novel and find out. But prior to doing it, I'd be kind of like, oh, fucking hell, God knuckle down and do it and then like you're saying like once you start and if i sort of manage to string together a few like decent once you got those first few words well actually i'm kind of cooking now this is is all right and occasionally it would feel good to be doing it Mm. and then having done it be like ah that's that's not so bad actually okay but i want to concentrate on this for a bit because it, it you know obviously this is a fun topic for both of us so you you were writing reviews and you were mainly doing film reviews Mm mm-hmm so, I, I mean, you know, perfect fucking job. You were a film critic. You, you got to watch movies, you got paid for it, and then you got to tell other people your thoughts on it. Which which movie fan doesn't love doing that? Yeah, I mean, I'd do that. Here's the thing I like. I wasn't getting paid. Here's my opinion on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect, perfect sort of role for you. Um, and you say... So, you saying you didn't really appreciate it at the time, or you... Or would you say it's more fair to just say it seems way more valuable now? I don't think I realised how good a gig I, I had yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, particularly as like finding something that, that that's so in the sweet spot of my interests. Yeah. Again, now that I'm out there in the general sort of job seeking pool. Yeah. Uh, it's elusive to the point of like non existent. Yeah. It's, mind you, I haven't really been pressing it. I don't know where I'd look. It's kind of like just rocking up like, hey, anyone need a a film reviewer? I've got great opinions. Um, there are... I mean, it's going to be online, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The thing is, it's looking for local things or it's, it's producing your own stuff. Have you... So, do you keep your hands in with the reviews? No. I when was the last while. time you wrote a review? Um, I wrote a music review fairly recently. Right. Um, I haven't written a film review for... I love your year. Yeah. But, and also, I just haven't been seeing as many films either because yeah. of various circumstances. But it's something that maybe I think I should get back into mm-hmm. just to keep it ticking over practice wise. Yeah. I, I mean, so how long were you doing it for? Uh, yeah, a few really years, like about five years. So, have you ever looked back at the writing that you've done? Like, so have you looked at it recently? I, I mean, I'm just wondering, what I'm basically driving towards is uh, how much how much do you think you improved over that period of time? Because you've been doing it on a regular basis. You're doing it professionally. Mm-hmm. You're doing something every day, you're going to get better at it. So, like, how much would you say you'd improved there? Well, it's hard to say. I think there definitely would have been some improvement, but I don't think, I don't, wouldn't know how to gauge it. Mm. Um, it would probably be useful for me to go back and look, look back over them. Yeah, I, I mean, like if I was you, I'd definitely have a record of all of them. So I've got I, them all in a folder yeah, somewhere. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think yeah. You know, keep your hand in. It, it's a skill that you've you've already started developing. Hmm. Uh, I think yeah, and it's a fun thing to do. Um, I, I like it's a it's a different. It's just, when I went back, I did my degree. I did film and media, and you know. Like, as film lovers, the main things that I find most interesting is watching films, talking about films, reading about films, writing about films, <laughs> and doing all the other stuff around film. So all yeah, of that, that is... Sounds always, about right. Yeah. <laughs> so doing it on a, on a professional basis. <laughs> but you, you are formulating your ideas better, and you're formulating more of a... Well, I would imagine more of a like your own voice as a as a critic as well, because how much of it when you're writing for people, how much of the writing was writing for an audience? Were you always writing for yourself, or were you writing for an imagined audience as well? Um, a bit of both, really. Um, I had to keep the audience in mind because with it being a free magazine that's uh, distributed quite widely around the mm-hmm. North Leeds area. Um, the readership is all over the map, really. Everyone mm-hmm. from students to OAPs and everyone in between. Mm-hmm. So I had to keep it fairly 
kind of broad in tone in a way. Um, so that requires some kind of adjustment of my voice so it wasn't totally exactly how I'd talk. Yeah. Um, but that was... Did you have to sort of modify your in. opinions a little bit as well of like... A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. What about other work that you've done? Un- unpaid work. So you, you've... You, you're a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, started with... So when I first met you, you were sax man. Yeah. Uh, then you were drummer guy for a while. Mm-hmm. And you're doing a bit of guitar now. A little bit. So uh, is that all three instruments or have you got more? Uh, mainly those. Um, yeah, that's more or less it. So on the band front, because you've been kind of like... So one of your bands, um, I saw you do a gig in London. Um, you went to a festival with them as well, didn't you? you played, did you play a couple of festivals with Alaska? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we did Green Man Festival. That was probably the biggest thing we did. Mm-hmm. Um, other sort of like smaller local festivals as well. Mm-hmm. Did that King of the Mountain one for the Tour de France. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So... Um, Let's discuss that for a bit as as work. Okay, so you're essentially doing unpaid labour and, and paying to work in some cases because I'm sure that some places where you're paying, they're like, ooh, but well, this is an exciting opportunity for you <laughs> to give me money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there must have been a bit of that. So um, just give us a sort of run through of... Well, I... I would you consider any of it work or any of it labour or uh, like where was the line drawn for you? Was it always sort of leisure time, fun time, pastime, or was this like something that potentially could turn into a revenue stream or like how did you approach it? That's how we thought maybe when we were younger and more naive, but when we started there was still sort of a music industry infrastructure, like but not like there is now. Mm. <clears throat> so when we began it was still possible for um, bands to be noticed by uh, A&R from a record label and mm-hmm. potentially sign a record contract yeah uh, and then that's when we figured the real work would begin where it would become a job for us yeah when we would be professional musicians and yeah. we wouldn't have to work other jobs to support yeah. ourselves where we could like support ourselves through playing music which mm-hmm. people would pay us for yeah but it's really difficult like being in an unsigned band is a lot of work a lot of expenditure Mm-hmm. Uh, so it costs you more than you make because mm-hmm. you have to buy your instruments mm-hmm. you have to journey to and from shows wherever they are mm-hmm. um, and a lot like you say it, like a lot of creative things people think these days people want everything for free we know that mm-hmm. but also like in terms of people like booking performance acts yeah um, it's very difficult to get paid for that kind of thing I suppose as well when people are paying for a band, they generally want covers because they want songs that people will know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So if you're if you're in a band where you're, you know, you're being a band, you're creating your own music and putting things together, and it, it's probably harder to sell that because, you know, you. Well, I suppose it's the mentality of the market as well that, you know, that like this is pitched at a certain audience, like, you know, like we all don't like different types and genres of music, you know, mm-hmm. we're all only interested in one genre of music. It's like, what's this band playing new stuff? I want 70s disco that I can recognise. Yeah, well, if, you, if you're a band and you learn like a solid set of covers and have a broad and expensive repertoire, then you can get gigs playing like weddings and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that can be like a really... Yeah. good source of revenue like um, a lot of musicians can work professionally from doing that kind of thing otherwise if you go to music college um, and become uh, sufficiently competent on your instrument then you can uh, work towards getting like session work that's yeah. another line um, if you just write songs or jingles or yeah stuff that gets used in video games and license that out that's another way to do it um is that is it a way to do it though i mean that you're still gonna have to put a lot of work in there i would imagine because there's a lot of there's a lot of copyright free music online for people to use and that's obviously people trying to put their work out into the world and sort of be noticed Mm -hmm. um 
So to actually make it pay, do you think that's a matter of like having the right connections and yeah, and it's just blind luck a lot of the time as well. I mean, the music industry is really fickle. Yeah. Uh, and it's disheartening to be in a band where you see other bands, you know, probably aren't as good as you, get elevated to a level of success where it's kind of like, what the, mm. why, why them and not us? Yeah. It's kind of like, well, who fucking knows? It's a crapshoot, man. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but I've I never really considered it as like work experience. Did you ever consider it work? It felt like work. It was lugging kit around and turning <clears throat> up and being on time. And, yeah, and yeah. Just like being under hot lights for an hour and sweating your ass off. It's, it's physical work <laughs> yeah. when you're playing. It's physical work getting to and from the gigs. Yeah. It's mental and emotional work dealing with like three, four, five dueling egos. Yeah, um, and and also the finding some level of compromise that's required when you're collaborating on creative projects, mm -hmm. whatever they may be, that's always going to be tricky mm. or can be. Um, so there's a lot of elements which, which are like quite taxing work, but I think that the experience is good because the, the skills that you learn through being in bands for years, they're transferable, but I would never have thought before to like bring them up yeah. when I'm looking for other work. It's kind yeah. of like, well, what have you done? It's kind of like, oh, well, I worked in this bar, I did this other kind of job. It's kind of like, oh, and I was in a band or a couple of bands for like 15 yeah. years. Yeah, so I can know, do planning and Which ain't nothing. I know. can do planning and logistics and organisation. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and, and I'm reliable and I'm yeah. And events management Yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, it improves your sort of interpersonal skills like you know, working as a team, things like that. Yeah. Plus, uh, plus um, I, this is one of my favourite quotes. Um, so, I, I don't know where I heard it, and it's probably mis misattributed, but um, to have another language is to have another soul, um, which is just a beautiful sentiment. Apparently, mm. it's Charlemagne. I don't know if that's right. Uh, if this goes on the internet, the internet will connect, correct me, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, and I, I, when I was working at a music college, talking to some of the lecturers there and the musicians and stuff, and and, and it's kind of the same thing. And I, and I think I had this reinforced somewhere, so I think this is an idea that I picked up from somewhere else as well. Um, like, if you learn another language, it changes your sort of, your, your thought and thinking pattern. I think it actually physically affects the brain as well, but I yeah, think it's it similar with music. So you, you're, learn, you're effectively learning another form of communication. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, so to, just having that different way of thinking, having a musical brain, if you like, um, that's going to give you a different approach to things. It's going to give you a different set of problem-solving skills and tools that you wouldn't necessarily have or a different way of thinking about problems. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not something that employers will think of because employers and recruiters overall just don't seem to be very imaginative people to me. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's just something that we assume. I, I mean, it, it, well, maybe it's a failure of the but... public to, maybe it's a failure of us to sell our skills, but like, um, if it's about selling skills, then surely the school should be teaching you how to sell skills rather than talking to you about, you know, whatever it is they talk to you about, careers advice these days, uh, but teaching people, you know, how to operate Word and Office and stuff like that. It's like, are any of these skills actually useful to to the market, to the, the individual? Um, yeah, I think we should learn how more useful stuff in the last sort of years of school, about how to sell stuff, how to market yourself, how to think about your skills transferably. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would agree with this, but my my sort of scholastic experience is like you you're little you you see your parents they work you're growing up you think right i have to go get a job i go through education i get a job if i go to university i get a better job <laughs> and that's it you just you know you grow up you get a job and if you've gone to university you get a better job um and it's just not like that at all it's just sort of you more kind of scramble around looking for anything that you can get and then you end up doing whatever yeah well as I started uh, getting older like 
uh, I was thinking I really should have like found some kind of career by now. Mm. And this is like, and this is a personal hang up of mine regarding my lack of education. But I sort of uh, decided, well, you know, careers are for graduates, and the rest of us just do jobs. Yeah, and that's probably bullshit. But you know, and it's just one of those things which I think that kind of maybe holds me back. But you know, it's spurring me on to get into education, but that's not the only thing. The main thing is I want to spend my time doing something that interests me. You're aware that as soon as education spits you out, you, <laughs> you're going to be back to square one. You, uh, you'll no. know this, you've been travelling. Yeah, no, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cling on for dear life. <laughs> right, okay, that's one step. How do, I, how do I stay in this little rarefied bubble? There might be a place for me in academia, who knows? Um, but may, another main reason that I want to pursue education is the fact that without having a degree, my possibilities for um, getting in the world of getting more into the world of teaching are really limited. So, postgraduate, uh, they then there's. What about a PGCE? Would it, like, how easy would it be just to do the PGCE? Is that a year? Well, still? the key thing is like the, the PGCE. You need bit. the degree first, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's postgraduate, isn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, following that, and also. I mean, I've heard like a couple of guys who were on the CELTA course that I did, they were doing PGCEs because they wanted to get into like um, secondary school teaching or whatever. Uh, they both dropped out um, because they said that it quickly became clear the amount of work involved and the ultimate end point and the payoff was like, it's so out of whack. And also a former um, partner of mine, She's a head of department at a local school, and she says that she wouldn't recommend anybody get into teaching, considering no. how fucked the system is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, um, you know, when they when they do these occasional runs, advertising runs of like coming to teach, and it was like 15, 20 years ago, maybe I would. It was a half decent job, but you know, now, no. I mean, if I was a web designer or a social media person, like the job market would be a fucking playground for me. I think more sort of development and stuff. Um, I like, you know, the developer side of stuff. But the way to do that is to do it as a contractor. So, you, you know, you're getting a day rate of you know, £350 or whatever. Um, which sounds great. I and mean, is great. I mean, you know, that's generally... I, I'm lucky if I can find a, a week's work in Leeds paying that much, you know. Mm. Um but yeah, for for the day. But they're they're the way that they're contracted out now is basically they're having to pay for every, you know they're paying their ni their their everything from that that cash. So it's like it's a nice it's a nice day rate, but the reality is that a lot of that's going on their themselves as a business, you know, covering everything else. Mm. Right, let's get a bit more wide ranging about sort of general work stuff. You. Well, if we start with something like technological in, unemployment or, or any of those things, right, especially now with, with a new government, there's going to be, and with Brexit, um, which, of course, will be an, a non-ending saga forever. But I do think now is a good time to be talking about work and what we expect from work and what work should expect from us and also the future of work. So how much thing, how much stock would you hold in things like the discussions about technological employment, unemployment. Um, what do you think? Do you think that there are already problems in the market, in the employment field? Do you think, do you believe the numbers of like, you know, record, record no. employment levels in the UK and things like that? I mean, like what's, how do you see the job market at the moment? How do you see it sort of? I think the figures are probably misleading. Yeah. Uh, just because some people are sometimes employed doesn't mean they're fully gainfully employed mm-hmm. to the point like if we talk about the number of people making a living wage then it's probably way yeah. below because we're talking zero hours contracts um, also you like referring to creeping automation resulting in mm-hmm. there being fewer jobs than there used to be mm-hmm. um, I, I think the more automation the better bring it on yeah um like um, Rucker Bregman saying that basically, you know, if we start working towards UBI and this kind of thing, he says the day that your job gets automized should be the happiest day of your life. Yeah. You know, if we're working in a functioning society. Yeah. Because if a robot can do a job, fucking let it. 
It gives yeah. us a bit more free time. That's one less thing that we have to be doing. And, and time it and energy that we can be spending elsewhere more fruitfully. I yeah, think. and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't expend energy in the same way that a human does. It expends energy in the way that capitalism imagines or wants energy to be expended that is at a constant rate at humans until go, they become they become humans the singularity and go, and when they become sentient then you know things are really going to kick <laughs> off but <laughs> it can't do any worse than we've done honestly it can't yeah. I, I mean like you know we've got the same guy on both sides of the atlantic I, <laughs> it's a blonde mop maniac <laughs> like you know, we're doing really well <laughs> oh who's the worst person in our society okay they are they can be in charge yeah, <laughs> hey, will the machines do any any worse than that I don't think so well they're probably going to be more geared towards efficiency yeah yeah unfortunately that spells curtains for us <laughs> <laughs> messy fleshy machines get them the fuck out of the way <laughs> really clean up this planet <laughs> um sorry what was the question <laughs> Uh, we can talk around it anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I'm, I, th- I think this one will probably edit a bit more, so I think we'll just like have more of a general chat. Let's I, free I, wheel. I, well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to start having to write down some some sort of guide questions, which I kind of wanted to avoid because I didn't want to make it too formulaic. Mm-hmm. But I think I'm going to need some sort of like ones to fall back on. Um, so when I listen back, I'm going to try and find sort of common themes and things to ask. Um, what do you think is a let's have a little discussion around talking about work so when do you talk about work uh at work obviously yeah at work just because you're in it and Mm -hmm. it's just the practicality of like what's happening next Mm -hmm. who's doing what what needs to be done yeah you know that's just functional work talk Mm -hmm. then Post work, uh, you know, the sort of decompression stage where it's like letting off steam, everyone has a bit of a gripe about the things that they don't like about work. Mm. Uh, generally, I like work outside of work hours to be limited. I don't like a lot of shop talk with, you know, colleagues. Uh, I prefer us to get around to subjects which interest me more about, you know, what, what kind of people the people are who I work with. Okay, well, so like that. keep that in mind. So take that schema and put that onto the band. So when you're talking band stuff, if you're talking about the band <clears> being, <throat> so if we imagine band being the job, so you talk about the music while you're there and you talk about the band dynamics while you're there, while you're practising, um, and then in a gig you would talk about the gigs sort of before or after... So, would you be much more amenable to talking about band stuff when you're not in a band mode, sort of thing? So, what I'm essentially asking is, if that w- if you compared them both as they were both jobs, they were both work, is the fun band work, uh, would you discuss that more than you would just your, your sort of regular job? Because it's more fun to discuss. Wait, you mean comparing, like, regular, yeah, recognised so, employment? Yeah. Like, say, working in an office or working in a bar or working... Yeah, so the, the paid stuff in a workplace like that, that you have to do... Compared to a band thing. So yeah. I, I was thinking splitting the band thing into two different work discussions. Because okay. there's the discussion of, uh, like, the nuts and bolts of the creative process, the, the practice of rehearsal, mm-hmm. of, like, getting the songs tight, practising... Yep your parts, things like that, Yeah, uh, making sure it sounds good, making creative decisions in the moment, mm-hmm. working together, arranging things, that all requires talking about in the space. And then there's the business side of it, if you like, or kind of stra- strategy, like mm-hmm. uh, what are we looking to do next? Where are we looking to get to? What's the best way of us doing that? Is there any way we can make any, squeeze any money out of this thing? Um, how are we going to pay for, you know, the outlay of fucking guitar strings, drumsticks, all this kind of shit, mm-hmm. getting to and from gigs, how like logistics, shit like that. Um, generally, I would prefer those discussions to happen away from the rehearsal studio. To mm-hmm. um, so like try and have a line between the sort of the the creative and the 
the nitty gritty, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, so what you're saying, comparing that kind of work talk. Yeah, I suppose what I'm guessing at is, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm basically saying those roles where you, you know, where you were working in. I mean, it, like, it, it might be comparable with the the film stuff. I mean, you probably talked to people about your reviews a lot more than you would have, like, you know, your work in whatever hospitality environment as well like oh i was working in the, mm. my career in hospitality and there was this really interesting story it's like no it's like but if you uh, oh i just wrote a review for this really awesome film have you read my review yeah. it's a much more interesting conversation to have so well, before or after like writing a review talking to people about it, it was like a first draft kind of thing you know so yeah because i i know well and then i'm also asking like do you think you would talk about work more if you're if, if you were being paid like if the work was more interesting, basically. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, definitely. I think. It's, but also, those are different quality of discussions that we would have in the band, mm -hmm. uh, in both aspects of it, both the creative and the logistical, compared to say if I worked in a bar where it's kind of like at the end of the night, I have a few beers with your coworkers, it'd be kind of like that shift was a fucking nightmare, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. And I'd have a table like doing my fucking head in. Yeah. all that kind of shit or like bitching about the manager and how they're not running it correctly it's like why do they do things like this why can't we do things <laughs> like that all that kind of shit um, uh, and obviously I'd participate in that and be somewhat invested in it but the difference is that'd be a job where I'd be working for someone else Yeah. whereas in a band you're working for yourselves recently mm. really it's, it's kind of that's what you're looking to get out of it so uh, it carries a bit more weight, which is why it can be a bit more fraught, and why it's it's always difficult being in those it's like creative situations, working with other people as well. So, when you were doing the film reviews, what, was that was it a full time position? Did it take up? Yeah, but I mean, I, obviously, you were doing <laughs> some other roles within that. And that wasn't a full time position. You weren't writing film reviews full time. <laughs> no, just like once a month, once, yeah. once or twice a month, something like that. But it, but the other work that you were doing that would fill up a full time role. Yeah. Um, and did you did you go into an office for that or was it working? Yeah, I went into an office, but it was such a small team that it's kind of like didn't really do but a lot the, of talking about. But at least it gave about. you that mindset of going to a place and and doing work, and then you sort of come back and you're out of work. Mm -hmm. Um. Was that more interesting to, so. I'm kind of getting at, I think, do you think that part of the reason, okay, part of the reason that you've taken hospitality roles is like, this is what you've done and you've got experience and in it already. But do you think that part of the reason that you're taking those roles is just because you don't want to think about the job or the career or, or just like, I don't want to have long discussions about it or, mm -hmm. and so is there any truth to that? Do you think you kind of just, in your mind, it, 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 because it's work, you know, that sort of, it's like working for the man or you know, yeah, it's, it's like, like you're not contributing. It's just like, well, you, I, I, I've joined the rat race or I've joined, you know, it's, it's like selling out to a degree. Yeah, unless it's work, which is, you know, um, really tied into who I am and what I care about. If it's something I'm really invested in if it's not that if it's a, just a job that i go to i don't want it following me home yeah, yeah uh and should it get to that point where i'm caring more than i should mm. or have to about something which i genuinely don't care yeah. about then if it, it becomes invasive yeah you know it's kind of like it's impinging on my time attention uh and my emotional mental state more than is necessary but do you think that's just do you think how much of you how much of that do you think is just egotistical of like the, the way that we're imagining ourselves like i'm 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 asking you but i'm kind of asking myself as well because <laughs> uh, so i don't want to work for the man and i don't want to work for you know i don't want to go and do a job where i'm just there to make some rich person richer mm. like I, I want to do something that has some sort of social benefit. I want something where I've got a bit of variety in my day, a bit of autonomy to what I'm doing. 
Um, I want people to trust that I have the ability to do certain things and that I don't need to be micromanaged. And they're kind of the important criteria. Like when I first started working, a big part of my criteria for working anywhere was a very 90s sort of work meme of like, oh, it's it's the people that matter. As long as I've got a great team. I don't know why I'm doing this voice. As long as I've got a great team. They all talk like that. (laughs) Um, So long as I've got a great team, I don't care where I work. I'm like, well... Yeah, and, and that is kind there of important. There is something to that. I've, the, yeah, I've felt the, that way before. I've worked for large companies, which are okay to work for, not great. Mm, uh, because the people made it okay. But I stuck around because the people I was surrounded with, like I, I made some of my best friends to this day through through that job. You know? Yeah. Uh, and two of the bands I've played in yeah. came out of that. Um, so that's why it was worthwhile and why I stuck around. Mm. But had it not been for those people, I wouldn't have lasted more than a year or two. Yeah. So I did a lot of like the call center jobs and things like that, like proper basic entry level, office based stuff. And then I kind of like fell more towards admin stuff where you're doing a bit more back office stuff. And I found that those sort of roles, as part of the work, you have to discuss work a lot. And so you're, you're talking about work a lot at work. And then the the sort of political gripes and stuff would more fall into, you know, if you go out with people after or you, it, it's a, outside of work where you do the venting and the griping. You don't be venting and griping at work. But I, I found that you the, the way you discuss work is different depending on the level that you're involved in mm-hmm. and how much, I suppose to a degree, it's how much responsibility they're giving you. So that's yeah, how much personal investment you have in it. Yeah, but but they're they're kind of the same, aren't they? It's, it's kind of like when it, it's an exchange, you have to if they're giving you responsibility, you have to personally invest in that because you are having to accept that responsibility to a degree. <coughs> Ideally, if you're getting more responsibility, you should be getting a more great reward for that. So obviously, it's in your interest to give more of a shit about it at mm. that point. If you uh, poorly compensated for the time that you put in mm. with limited responsibility, you're just not going to care that much, are you? No. It's a no-brainer. Have you done any, uh, have you done any supervisory role where you've done, while you've been in hospitality? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <clears throat> so how was that sort of running well. teams and stuff? Was that, was that okay? Was it uh, just more hassle of like, having to deal with personalities? and? A little bit, but I, I kind of, enjoyed it because having worked for other people you can sort of pick up on the mistakes they make or you know all the things they did right yeah yeah uh and so you think if i'm ever in a management role i won't be like that to people because that sucks and i know from working under people like that what, mm. what it's like so that's that's why i think anybody who works in in hospitality or anything really but i've seen it more in hospitality it's kind of like because p- decisions are made up the chain mm-hmm. by people who don't know what's happening like on the, the ground level, mm-hmm. um, which have an impact on their staff. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, they all they see are numbers. It's kind of like, well, I'm spending too much on labor. I need to cut that down. It's kind of like, you do that during a busy shift. Everyone suffers. People have a shittier dining experience. The staff are run ragged, don't make as many tips mm-hmm. and get dissatisfied. And then the performance is poor. Mm-hmm. But if you have worked enough there, then you're kind of like, oh, we need, this is how we need to run it. Mm-hmm. And this is how to treat people. And this is how not to do things. Uh, and then hopefully you'll still remember that if you ascend up the, the chain. Mm. Um, and some people may just go straight in at a management level, uh, not knowing what the reality of the situation on the ground is. Mm-hmm. And that leads to screw ups. Well, in, they've in just they, they've just done their B tech or H and D or whatever in hospital hospitality yeah. and come in in a management position and it's like you need to all do this. It's like, what do you know? We've worked here for six years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they're already on starting from a disadvantaged position in terms of like gaining the respect of people who mm. are, um, they're working with or who are working for them, mm. whatever. Um, so yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, when you when you were 
in that sort of position of, of supervising did that obviously you get hopefully I would say not obviously hopefully you were getting paid more yeah did that did that sort of reel you in more did it make you feel more responsible did you feel more committed to the business yeah I guess so yeah I think so in a way did you feel any more ownership from that commitment so ownership's a weird one because like loads of employers want engagement they're very big in engagement of like no you must really believe in us and it's like We'll make it worth my while. Well, well, no. that's it. Yeah, no. promise me that you're not just going to fire me arbitrarily and that you're going to pay me more than this pittance and I might be interested. Mm. <laughs> Come back to me and we'll talk then. I mean, and there are ways to do that in in any industry. You know, I'm sure that, like, you can figure out some benefits for your staff to mm. to make them feel happier and, and, and more cared about, you know. Because a lot of... A lot of businesses will talk a good game about, like, you know, caring for the staff and people who work for them. But I don't think it's possible, though. I think the, the problem with this is, like... Because of industries of scale? Well, it, no, because the, the fundamental market reality is, if it doesn't make money, it's got to go. Hmm. Like, and as long as that exists, right, and, as long, you know, okay... I'm essentially, in my mind, I'm already blaming this on hierarchical, you know, vertical structures of, of organisations. The, the, the total lack of democracy within the place where we spend most of our time. You know, so we supposedly live in a democracy. We spend most of our time away from our family, away from our friends, in a place with strangers. Um, and that's where we're going to spend most of our life. Mm-hmm. And we get no say in that and in how it operates and how it works and, and what we do and what's going on there. Some people get more say than others depending on where you are in the hierarchy and so on. But um, I think as long as you have that set up, there is no way that anyone can be properly invested within a firm because they are not part of the firm. They are not stakeholders in the firm. Even if mm. they're getting paid or whatever, whatever strings the company's got attached to them, if it needs to, it will just get rid of you like if it has to and and that's logical within the logic of that i don't think you're going to get any real engagement or you know investment in human resources until the organizations are sort of collectively owned by people until Mm. they have a stake um you know i i can't see unions coming back in in the same way or the same form as you know like i mean when we had, when we got some workers' rights, and you had that union membership uh, that that pushed that through, that the, you know that was militant and actually got stuff done. After Thatcher and Reagan crushed the unions, like I don't think that they're they're having a bit of a renaissance, but I don't think they can come back in the same way. Mm, I think no, that we really have to come back really in a different way. In places in Europe where it's kind of like employees are given. Like more of a stake in the business, but like um, you know, boards uh, made up of like you know actual people who work within yeah. the company, yeah, rather than you know a bunch of like faceless bureaucrats and money men sort of. Yeah, and and, and it, uh, it amazes me as well. Of like, you've got because you know you've got all these layers of uh, I'll just say layers of abstraction of like you, you, your tiers of the hierarchy, uh, but the best person for the top person to hear from is the bottom person mm. the, you know the boots on the ground the people who are at the coal face the people who are on the front line how right? often do those conversations take place never mm. never it's like you know you've got this whole sort of chinese whispers between the person who's making the commands at the top and the people who are executing it at the bottom and then everyone else has got their little ego things going on in between mm. and like a lot of the time if <coughs> if, if if people at the top knew what was actually going on at the bottom and vice versa. I mean, because I've been in roles where you sort of supervisory roles and you kind of privileged more information there that people, let's say on the front line or people that you're overseeing, don't necessarily have that information. And they don't have that information because they don't really need that information and they're probably not bothered about it. You know, you're getting paid to know that information. But because they don't have that perspective, you make up your own reasons for what that motivation is of why you're being told whatever. Does yeah. That, does well, they sense? kind of imagine that a lot of these companies are probably 
reading these exhaustive, well-researched reports, which repeatedly say that an unhappy, unhealthy workforce is more productive. I've got that right. <laughs> wait, wait, no, it's not what I'm saying. No, 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 that, that, that's the practice. That's not the theory. Oh, okay, right. So yeah. the, the, the theory is that if your staff are happy and, like, you know, well-fed and looked after and educated, then they're more productive. Hey, and, oh, and that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, okay. but the practice is the opposite. That's what we, So we just make everyone as miserable and as poor as possible until they die. Uh, okay, that's a bit of a bummer. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a bit of a bummer. Um... Oh, we had, we had more. Oh, come on. You, throw me a question. Um, coffee? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Episode four, done and dusted. It just remains for me to say thank you for listening. You don't need me to tell you to like, share, subscribe, donate on Ko-fi or Patreon. But doing so offers encouragement and reinforcement, so I'm incentivized to do so. Any support you offer, including and beyond listening to me, is seriously appreciated. If you would like to be a guest, you can contact me via the website or DM me on Twitter at Western Studios 2 or Instagram Western underscore Studios underscore Leads. Uh, that's it. Back soon.